Mom, would you pray for us as we get started? Heavenly Father, we come before thee now, and we thank you for this church that we have to come and worship you. And we thank you for the people that are here. And Lord, be with us and guide us in the way that we need to go. And thank you for each and every blessing you give us. And be with us daily as we try to serve you. And this is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So this morning, uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8. Uh, we're going to look at the conclusion. Uh, so let me ask you this morning. Uh, have you ever expected to buy something but wasn't able to complete the purchase? Oh, man, have we not all been there? Uh, I remember uh, a bunch of years ago, there was a truck that I had my eye on that I wanted real bad. Uh, it was exactly what I was looking for. It was it was absolutely, it was perfect. Uh, I was excited to find it, and the sales rep was excited to sell it. Uh, we worked through the process only to find out that I couldn't buy it at that point. Uh, a lot of things uh, a lot of things, there were things that were going on, things that happened that I, I was unaware of, uh, and so I wasn't able to do it. I was disappointed, I was embarrassed, I was frustrated, but that sales rep was pretty disappointed too. They thought that they had a slam dunk, you know, and it just didn't work out that way. Uh, there was a lot of setup, you know, a lot of work that went into it, but no conclusion. Uh, today we conclude... Uh, we talk about the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark. Now, you say, well, I thought we still had another week left in the book of Mark. We do. Uh, we actually do. We still have a, a few more days to read through the passage of Mark before we're completely through. Uh, but today we see the conclusion, the climax, the uh, what Jesus has been working toward through his entire earthly ministry has been leading up to the, the empty tomb. So we're going to look at the conclusion this morning. Now, before I get too deep into it this morning, I think it's important to note, it, to note that there are different views on the ending of Mark, on the way Mark ends. Uh, the oldest manuscripts that we have stop at the end of verse 8. Now, up into the 2nd and 3rd century, there was a, the ending that we know today that was starting to appear. But the oldest ones that we have don't have anything past verse 8. Now, uh, I want to acknowledge it. Now, and there's three different kind of things to think about as we're looking at this. Now, Mike is, Mike, Mark is very concise in his <laughs> telling of the gospel. Uh, it's the shortest gospel. He's very matter of fact. It reminds me of the old, now I didn't watch the TV show, probably Mr. Mr. Ken might have, but there was a, the, a guy that used to say, all we want's the facts, man. Amen. Yeah, uh, so Dragnet. I didn't watch Dragnet. That was before my time. Uh, so I thank you, Mr. Ken, for bringing that out. Uh, but that's the idea I get when I read the book of Mark. Just the facts. Give me what I need. Not a lot of extra stuff. Not a lot of commentary. Just facts. Uh, and to that end, there are some people that believe that Mark ended at the end of verse 8. And we'll see that a little bit more on purpose. That here's the facts, here's what happened, done. Uh, now, there's another group that believe that believe that Mark had a longer ending, uh, had more to it, but it's been lost to us somewhere over the centuries. Somewhere between the time it was written uh, and around the second, third century, that it got lost somehow. Just the ending piece of it. And, and so, and I don't know. But the important things to say and we got 12 more verses in the book of Mark that we're going to read this coming week before we officially end Mark. But there, there's nothing new there. There's nothing that Mark sets forth that's not already presented in the other Gospels. So it's all stuff that we already know to be true. And, and some people believe that maybe a scribe added it to just kind of end it. I'm not, I, I'll be honest with you, honest enough with you to tell you that I don't know enough to make an educated decision. There are really, really smart people that don't agree on what the ending of Mark. So I just wanted to point it out to you that there are some differences. And when you come to places like this where people differ on how to end it or what the ending should be, 
I think we should focus on what we know to be true. Because throughout the Bible, there will always be things that you don't understand. There will be things that will be controversial. There will be things that will be confusing. So focus on what you do know. Uh, now, and some of you may wish I'd go deeper into that, and I welcome you to go and find out everything you can about it and come tell me. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm not, my feelings would not be hurt at all. Now, but the Bible gives you plenty of opportunities to do that. So I encourage you to do that. But, but I just wanted to get that out of the way and make that conclusion because I'm going to reference it again. But so now let's look here in Mark chapter 16. Uh, beginning in verse 1 through 8. And, and I always like to present kind of the sermon in a sentence, what I'm trying to present with the sermon. And my sermon in a sentence for this week is, Jesus' work led to the empty tomb. All that he worked on ended or, or worked up to the empty tomb. That's why he came to earth. That's why he died, was to give us the proof that we needed by looking into that empty tomb. So let's read together now. Mark chapter 16, beginning verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, brought, bought spices so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away this stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was a very large stone. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let's pray. My God and my Father in heaven, as I bow before you, Lord, I just ask you to give us clarity as we study this word, Lord, as we look into your word and try to understand what it meant for them, how it applies to us, and how we can be strengthened in our faith and strengthen others by these things. God, help us to do that. Father, I just want you to know how deeply we love you, how grateful we are for your word and what it does in our hearts. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can see why, if it ended at verse 8, how that would be what we might know as a cliffhanger ending, right? And... Uh, look at how it ended up. It says, For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, we know the other gospel writers say that they ran back. Uh, Mary Magdalene stayed behind. We know uh, that she saw Jesus uh, in the garden. We know that uh, James and John, or, yeah, James and John ran back. We know John got there first because he was faster. Uh, we know all of those things from the other gospel writers, but this is where Mark ends it. Uh, based on the oldest manuscripts. But there's four things I want us to see that are set up in this passage of Scripture. The first is the idea of preparation. So uh, Mary and Mary and Salome were headed to the, to the tomb. But before they headed to the tomb, what did they do? Now, Sabbath, what does Sabbath mean? Well, that was the day that Jew, in Jewish tradition, everything shuts down. Nothing happens. No work, no play. No groceries. You had to have everything ready. If you remember back in the Old Testament, even with the manna, they had to get enough on the day before the Sabbath for two days because they wouldn't even, couldn't even go out and gather on the Sabbath. Everything shuts down on the Sabbath. So when the Sabbath was passed, now the Sabbath, now when did the Sabbath pass? Well, it would have passed on Saturday evening at sundown. So Saturday evening after Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices. So why did they buy spices? Uh, they couldn't buy them on the Sabbath because everything was shut down. So as soon as Sabbath was over, they went and bought spices for Jesus' body. Now why would they buy spices for Jesus' body? Well, they bought it to cover the smell. Let's be honest. Do you remember when, when 
Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you remember when he told them to remove the stone so they could go into Lazarus? Do you remember what Mary said? I sure feel stupid. Don't do it. He smells. It's been three days. He's starting to smell. So Mary and Mary and Salome have bought spices, and they're preparing to go take them to Jesus to anoint him. Now, something's interesting here. What did Jesus tell them? And we've read, read it three different times in the book of Mark where Jesus told them that he, what was going to happen? He was going to die, right? He was going to be crucified. But that wasn't the end of it, right? But they weren't expecting it to happen just yet. They expected to find Jesus in the tomb. So they bought spices so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, so early the next morning, they got up. When the sun had risen, and they went to the tomb. So Mary and Mary and Salome. Now they're, well, let's put our, ourselves in their in their shoes for a minute. This man that meant so much to them had been brutally murdered. What do you think their attitude was? Angry. Do what? Angry. Oh, angry, sad, hurt. Uh, this enormous feeling of loss. They're going to lay. I, I'm. I, I would imagine they still had tears in their eyes, tears that came really easily. They're broken, they're heartbroken, but they're still going to go do all that they can for Jesus. So they go, uh, and they went to the tomb. And verse three says, "And when they were, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb?'" Now notice the night before they went and bought the spices, but they didn't go get anybody. You know, if I if I know that I'm going to go anoint the Jesus's body with spices, and I know that he I've got to get into the tomb, what what's the next logical thing? You're going to find somebody strong, right? Uh, if I know I can't do it, I got to bring people with me so I can do it. And so they're already questioning how will we roll away the the entrance the stone from the entrance of the tomb. So we see them preparing to interact with Jesus. To, to go to go anoint his body, to put spices on him, to keep the smell down as, as an act of worship, out of respect. So the next thing we see is this realization, this idea. So they were preparing, but there was a realization. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, and looking up, so they could see it from a ways off. And as they get up, they look up, and they see the stone had been rolled back. It was a very large stone. So we're not talking about a rock. We're talking about a large stone, something that was a fresh tomb. We know that. We read that earlier last week. Uh, that Nicodemus had hewn this stone, or had it hewn out of the rock. It was a cave with a rock set in front of it, so nothing could get in. And we know that uh, Caesar, or not Caesar, but Pilate had set a seal on it so nobody could get into it, or if they had, they could see. And there, we know from the other gospel writers there had been but armed guards around, and we know all these things. So they looked up, not expecting to see what they saw. And they looked up, and they saw, it says, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alone. Right? Right? So what happens? I'm going, I'm heartbroken, I'm going to go anoint the body of Jesus as an act of respect. Now, anything I can do to honor him for all he's done in my life. And I go, and I'm talking with my friends, and I don't know what kind of conversation, I don't even know if they were talking, to be honest with you. I think it would, I think, I don't know that I would have been able to talk thinking about what I had to do, going to the tomb, trying to figure out how they're going to roll back the stone, and they look up, and the stone's already rolled back. It's already moved. Big stone's already moved. And they see it open, so they, they go, and they go inside the tomb, and what do they do? They see somebody sitting. Now imagine, I can't imagine, Jesus had been laying there. And they just go up and they see just some guy. Just sitting. Dressed all in white. And they were alarmed. 
that might be an understatement. Alarmed, shocked, taken aback. Uh, so, so we see that they were preparing. We see that there was this realization, but there is an announcement that we need to talk about. Look at verses 6 and 7. And it says, And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. Have you ever have you ever seen somebody really upset and told them not to be upset? <laughs> do, do you think that does any good whatsoever? So yesterday, I'll tell you a story. Let me take that quick aside. So I've been wanting cinnamon rolls for the last week or two. And I was going to make cinnamon rolls, but I know that's Amanda's thing. She likes that's her therapy. She likes to cook. So I said, find us a recipe. And we found this recipe, and we were going to start to make cinnamon rolls. And Amanda started to make cinnamon rolls. Well, something did not work right. Well, it said, the recipe said the batter will be sticky. Well, that was an understatement because it poured like batter. Uh, cinnamon roll dough is not supposed to look like batter. And she's trying to incorporate more flour in, and her fingers are sticky, and she's trying to knead. Have you ever tried to knead soup? Well, that's, I mean, it was like, and there was dough all over the counter, all over her implements, all over her hands, all over everywhere. And at some point, she just got really frustrated. I don't remember what she said, nothing ugly. But I don't remember what she said. <laughs> Will you get the flour out so I can add more flour? That's what it was. Will you get the flour out so I can put more flour? And I was washing dishes like a good husband is supposed to. And I was washing dishes, and I dried my hands. I went and got the flour, and I'm like, how much do you want? Just leave it there, okay? Now, I know better than to say you need to calm down. So what happens if I tell her to calm down? There's a rolling pin there. <laughs> I have no doubt I would have gotten hit. So what do you think? What do you think the reaction was of these women who were obviously distraught, going to expect expect to have somebody roll back the stone so they can anoint the body of Jesus, to find the body that rolled back, and to see some guy sitting where Jesus had been laying, and told you, "Don't be alarmed." I think there's. They're, they're, they were probably like, you need to shut up and tell me what I need to know. Uh, it says, he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is, he is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Go, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he said. So let's look at this. I love this, y'all. This is uh, this passage of scripture is one of my favorite passages of scripture in all scripture. It gives me so much hope. It gives me so much encouragement. He told them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where he laid, where he laid him. Now we know when the other gospel writers said that his the burial cloths were folded. The, it was all laying there neatly. Uh, but I'm sure that there was evidence there. There had to be evidence that he had laid there. So they weren't in the wrong tomb. They were where they knew that they were supposed to be. But he wasn't there. But they say he's risen. He's not here. Look, look at this place. This is where they laid him. But go tell his disciples what? Peter and Peter. Why and Peter? You remember Peter? Just three days before this, what happened with Peter? Mm -hmm. See, God, it, it, we talked about the passion of Peter last week. We talked about how Peter had passionately defended that he would not deny Jesus no matter what. And, and then we saw with that same passion, he denied Jesus three times. With that same adamant uh, nature that Peter had, that same energy, that same... Uh, Ego, arrogant, what? Fervor. Fervor. He denied Jesus. And even began to curse that, that he never knew the man. Go tell my disciples, go tell his disciples, but don't forget Peter. 
Peter, what did Peter do when he when he heard that rooster crow? The Bible tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly, broken hearted, heartbroken over what had happened, over what he had done, the realization of what he had done. He was heartbroken and he went out and he wept bitterly. But the angel, and we do know it's an angel from the other gospel writers, but the angel said, hey, go tell my disciples, but make sure you tell Peter. Man, if we want to talk about forgiveness, man, this is one of the best pictures of forgiveness in the Bible. Go tell my disciples and Peter. Don't forget Peter, that he's going before you to Galilee. There he will see you. This great announcement, he's not here, he is risen. Uh, Amanda was asking me this morning what kind of songs uh, for the worship, and I said, well, we're talking about the resurrection, so just about anything goes. Uh, this is a celebration service. This is where we get to celebrate. This is where we get excited. This is where we see firsthand the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And the last thing I want us to see, this last thing I see here in verse, uh, comes in verse 8, is the reaction. What is their reaction? And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, the oldest manuscripts we have stop here. And so, if it stops here, what's your, what's your question? I'll tell you what my question is. They were told to go tell somebody, but what does it say? They said nothing to anyone. Well, I think, I think what that probably means is they didn't say anything on the way. They were racing to get to where it is. And we know the other gospel writers said that they went back <coughs> to where the disciples were, and they told them, and the, the, a couple of the disciples raced back to see the empty tomb for themselves. We, we know those things, but look what happens. They were told to go, and they went. See, everything about what we have, we have read through Mark led us to this point. So we, we talked about the overall theme of the book of Mark is painting Jesus as this suffering servant. Why did he suffer so that there could be an empty tomb? Why did he serve so there could be an empty tomb? Everything he did was for this empty tomb. You say, well, I, what is, I, I thought the cross was the pinnacle of what Jesus did. It did, but this gave us proof. Everything else is set up. This proves what happened. It's kind of like when I tried to buy a truck. I told them I wanted to buy it. I went in and started, we started paperwork, but it stopped. They wanted to run my credit. Why do they run your credit when you want to buy something on credit? Now, you can buy something flat out, but most of us don't buy a vehicle flat out. We want to finance it, and they want to know your credit. Why? <laughs> to prove that you can pay for it, or as much proof as they can get. They want, to make, they want some assurance. They want some proof. And that's what this did to us. See, did Jesus need the stone to be rolled away in order to raise from, come out of the grave? No. No. The Bible says during those three days that he went into the heart of the earth and, and the, led captivity captive, that he preached deliverance to the saints. We, we know that uh, after he was in Emmaus with the disciples that the Bible says, one of the other gospel writers says that he, he disappeared like through a wall. So did he need the stone to be rolled away? So why was the stone rolled away? So they could go to the grave. That's right. So they could go in and see where he lay. See, the empty tomb is proof of what happened. Jesus' death on the cross paid all of our sin debt. He, it, it reconciled the human beings with God Almighty, but the empty, per, empty tomb proves what happened. See, Jesus' life led to a sacrificial death offered to reconnect every human being to God, the God that loves them. The empty tomb proved that it was done. See, it was the proof of God's power. The tomb was proof. Uh, Jesus' work was to prove how much that God loves me and loves you. Maybe, but maybe you're like, does God really love me? Maybe you, earlier in the week, 
last week, we read Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And I don't have that passage up here to show you, but it's going to ring a bell when I read it. Again, Mark 15, 34, for those of you who are following along, it says, Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you shut yourself off to me? Why have you done that? See, there's a lot of times uh, in Sunday school we were talking about the different trials and stuff. And I'll be honest enough to tell you that there are trials I've been through that I've looked up into heaven and I've said, God, where are you? You promised you'd never leave me. you never forsake me. Where are you? See, Jesus looks up to heaven and he says, My God, my God, why have you, have you forsaken me? Now, had the Father forsaken the Son? Never. Ever. But there was a work that had to be done here. Friends, in our life, there are things that happen that we don't like, that are uncomfortable, that are painful, that, that are terrible. <laughs> See, if you're in this place, let me encourage you to hang on. You just haven't made it to the tomb yet. The victory is coming. See, this morning maybe God has been preparing you for the moment that you'd realize your need for salvation. Maybe he's put people in your life to announce what Jesus has done. And maybe he's hoping your reaction will be not to run away, but maybe he's hoping that your reaction will be to come to Jesus. See, the proof's there. We just have to accept it. Friends, this morning, the empty tomb stands in proof of God's power, God's love, God's forgiveness. It's the proof of it all. I can tell you that I'm a Chinese fighter pilot, but at some point, what are you going to want me to do? Get in a plane and prove it, right? I can tell you that I can dunk from the three-point line. Show me, right? Well, the empty tomb shows that Jesus was everything he claimed to be. Friends, this morning, that gives me hope. That is the conclusion of his life. And think about it for a minute. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To reconcile man and God, right? But to prove God's great love for us. He was, what do we call him? We call him God in human flesh. Why? Because he took on role of flesh so that he could sympathize with us, so we could touch him, so we could uh, hear from him, so we could, he was the visual proof of God's love for us. That's the conclusion of the matter. I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. I'll remind you that Jesus' work led to this empty tomb. It led to the cross, but if it just stopped at the cross, where's the proof? tomb is the proof. Friends, this morning, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're like Jesus, and you're saying, where are you, Father? Why have you abandoned me, Father? Well, you know, the Bible says that he will never leave us. He will never abandon us. We've got to be careful of our emotions, because sometimes our, we don't feel that he's there. Don't let your feelings distract you from the fact that God will never leave you for sake. That he did everything he promised he would do. Let's pray again. My God and my Father in heaven, as I bow before you this morning, Lord, I am grateful for the empty tomb. I am grateful for the cross. I'm grateful that he died for me. But Lord, the, the death wasn't just a death of some martyr. It was the death of my Savior dying for my sins. And Father, I am grateful for the empty tomb that proved that he had the power of death and hell and grave. 
Lord, I'm, I'm grateful that you revealed it to women that in that culture didn't really have a voice, but they got to be the voice of the announcement. Father, I am grateful that if you did that then, then all of your other promises will be just as true. And Father, we look for the coming of Jesus, for the rapture of the church, for the millennial <laughs> kingdom, for the days when Satan is finally put down once and forever, when we will have glorified bodies and we won't have to worry about all of these various trials that James talked about. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us. And thank you for Jesus. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, for those of you who have been watching, uh, if you've been watching with us, give us a like or a thumbs up just so we'll know that you've been there today. And... Uh, I pray that this has been an encouragement to you, a challenge to you, that it's been a blessing to you. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you next time.